Hi, I'm an emergency room physician. Just yesterday, I diagnosed a woman in the ER with advanced metastatic cancer that could have been avoided if she had gotten regular routine screenings. She didn't have access to these because she didn't have access to adequate insurance that she was afraid to apply for due to her immigration status. This needs to change. Healthcare is a human right. Please help. I am Candace Brown, a licensed professional mental health counselor. After last year, what does recovery look like? Recovery looks like working on our mental and emotional health. We know that many communities of color are struggling with their mental health, depression, anxiety, or even suicidal ideation. They're dealing with systemic racism or even accessing proper care. But there's hope, there's healing, and we're ready to help. Thank you. Greetings, I am Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul. This past year has caused many of us to reflect upon the racial inequities that impact the various determinants of quality of life. With regards to healthcare in particular, the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified the need to address inadequate access to and implicit bias within healthcare. The continued fight to preserve protections of the Affordable Care Act the disproportionate number of deaths due to the coronavirus in black and brown communities, the vaccine hesitancy driven in part by a history of experimentation on black people, and concerns about racism and implicit bias by healthcare providers are but a few of the challenges we must take on to end racial disparities in healthcare. I'm excited that the Shriver Center on Poverty Law is taking on the fight to end racial inequities in healthcare. As a son of a community physician 
who for 30 years served patients on the south side of Chicago with a commitment to healthcare as a human right, I commit the resources of the Illinois Office of the Attorney General to fight alongside the Shriver Center to address systemic inequities that persist in American healthcare. Thank you to Shriver for taking on this fight. Hi, I'm an emergency room physician. Just yesterday, I diagnosed a woman in the ER with advanced metastatic cancer that could have been avoided if she had gotten regular routine screenings. She didn't have access to these because she didn't have access to adequate insurance that she was afraid to apply for due to her immigration status. This needs to change. Healthcare is a human right. Please help. Good morning. My name is Kenya Lambert, and I serve as the Vice President of Development for the Shriver Center on Parvey Law. Welcome to the Shriver Center's 2021 virtual event series, The Road to Recovery. Today's event focuses on ending racial disparities in healthcare. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for funding this series and the Shriver Center's ongoing advocacy training, litigation efforts. In addition, I'd like to give a special shout out to our title sponsor, GCM Grocer. 
presenting sponsors, AARP Foundation and Sitley, and platinum sponsor, JP Morgan Chase. We're so excited to have you here with us for our very first conversation in our year-long series. We hope you're inspired and ready to emerge from this crisis with renewed activism for equity. I have several Zoom tips for you. Use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to connect with us and be in community. Use the Q&A box during the panel discussion to ask your questions. The Shriver Center on Poverty Law leads the fight for economic and racial justice. Let's take a moment to tell you who we are. And now, a brief video about the Shriver Center. Roll it! In so many ways, this moment in time is so crucial for the Shriver Center as it is for the rest of the country. Shriver's work has always been evergreen. As long as there's been poverty, as long as there's been racial injustice, we've been here fighting that good fight. This is a moment where our work is being highlighted for everything that we've been saying for over 50 years, talking about why it is so important for us to be focusing on racial and economic justice. People now see manifested in COVID and manifested in, in this period of racial awakening. Change laws and change lives. Not one, not two, not thousands, but millions of people. Today we litigate, shape policy, and train multi-state networks of lawyers, community leaders, and activists nationwide. We see ourselves as building up an army of advocates that are equipped to do their anti-poverty work with racial justice at the core. Understanding as a legal advocate that you are working in partnership in collaboration with community, and you are not the lead of this movement. There's more of an urgency when it's actually your situation. We need to make sure that our systems are giving people what they actually need to live a dignified life. To unapologetically tackle racial inequities. This is just a fraction of our work, and there's still so much more to do. And that's why we need to use this momentum to propel our work forward using litigation and policy advocacy to affect change where it's needed most. You're actually part of this right now. We're all part of the movement. No podemos hacer esto sin ti. And we can't do this work without you. We are the movement! Go forth and use your voice for positive change. Thanks for coming. What a year it has been. In 2020, we saw a global health pandemic and economic crisis that drove millions into poverty and exposed the inequities experienced daily by Black and Latino communities. Our country also mourned and reckoned with the violence against Black lives and called out the legacy of structural racism embedded in our systems. Already in 2021, we've seen a new president and vice president take office an attempt to reverse the dangerous policies of the former administration. We've, got, we've begun to administer vaccines, but we've also seen a tragic surge of violence throughout the country and violence and hate against the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And we know that it's a heavy moment right now in Chicago and across the nation as we continue to mourn the deaths of more black and brown lives lost at the hands of police. Where do we go from here? Well, we know that racism is the major driver of inequities embedded in the fabric of this country. Today, we'll discuss how this impacts our healthcare system and how you can be a part of that solution. Today's conversation highlights the lasting impact COVID-19 has had on the health of Black and Latino people and the strategies to improve outcomes for these communities. Before we meet our esteemed panel, I would like to tell you that Attorney General Raul sends his deepest regrets for being unable to attend today's important conversation. His presence was requested for another event by the Biden administration. Today, we'll still hear from Amy Meek, who works with uh, Attorney General Raul 
She currently serves as the Civil Rights Bureau Chief at the Illinois Attorney General's Office, where she works to strengthen and enforce civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination. And then she supervises those investigations of complaints in housing, public accommodations, employment, and financial matters. Welcome, Amy. We'll also hear from Dr. Janice Blanchard, she is an adjunct affiliate researcher in the Health at Rand Corporation and associate professor of emergency medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Her research includes access to healthcare for vulnerable communities and the impact of policy changes on health and healthcare access. Dr. Blanchard also serves as a board member for the Shriver Center on Poverty Law. Welcome, Dr. Blanchard. We'll also hear from Marilena Encapie. She is the executive director of the National Immigration Law Center and has two decades of experience in the movement for immigrant justice. Marilena is well known for leading national policy campaigns, including the creation and successful implementation of deferred action for children for childhood arrivals, also known as DACA. Welcome, Marilena. Last but not least, we'll hear from Audra Wilson. She is the new president and CEO of the Shriver Center and also an alumnus of the organization. For over 20 years, Audra has been a champion for justice. More recently, Audra was the executive director of the League of Women Voters of Illinois. Prior to that, she served as chief of staff for Congresswoman Robin Kelly. She also served as the deputy press and policy director for then State Senator Barack Obama's U.S. Senate campaign. So let's get started. Before I hand it over to Audra, let's hear from one of our community partners. Thank you. My name is Dr. Whitney Lynn. What is the most important issue in healthcare for my family? myself and my community um, is building trust and equity um, in healthcare. We need our community to trust medicine and to know that vaccines are safe. Um, and we need the help, we need this to help the, to end the pandemic. Um, we've seen in our community, many of our community members die um, and we are dying at a disproportional rate of 3.5 times more than our white counterparts. And really this pandemic has really shown that we need more minorities in medicine and having more minorities in medicine might help build that trust and help end disparities in healthcare. Thank you so much, Kenya. And good morning and welcome to everyone. We're so happy that many of you have taken time out of your busy schedules to join us for this very important discussion. And thank you to our esteemed panelists for sharing your time and expertise with all of us. As you're all friends with Shriver, we're gonna forego the titles and make this a bit more conversational. So let's jump right in as we have a lot to cover. As we've witnessed for over a year, COVID-19 is a massive health crisis that transcends age, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. But for the purposes of today's discussion, I'd like for our panelists to discuss briefly what they see as the unique impact of COVID on communities of color. I'm gonna start with you, Janice. Tell us some of your thoughts. So I, um, this is, I've worked on the front lines um, since this pandemic started. So I've really seen a unique perspective, but what I think uh, COVID has really done is highlighted some inequities that have always been there. It's just shown it and brought it to the face of America. These things aren't new. We're just, you know, paying more attention to them. So um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk to all of you today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Marielina, how about you? Tell us some of your thoughts about where we are today and especially the impact on immigrant communities. Yes, so thank you again for the invitation. Wonderful to be here with uh, you, Audra, and your new role and the Shriver Center's leadership on racial and economic justice. I could not agree more with Janice. I think the, the pandemic has exposed 
pre-existing uh, inequities, not just in our health and safety systems, but also in our racialized economy and in our immigration and labor systems that have continued to exclude millions of black and brown workers from, the, from having the safety and having um, the, the health and wellness that they need in their communities so that people um, are able to not only survive, but really that they have the freedom to thrive. And for immigrant communities, um, you know, many of whom are working in um, the, at the forefront of what's called the essential worker industries, um, we're talking about, um, it's an estimated 70% of immigrants work in one of these industries. Um, that means they're not able to work remotely and they're working oftentimes in really uh, horrendous uh, health and safety conditions in the workplace. They're often uh, working in close uh, quarters and are living um, in, in um, uh, also close quarters with family members or other roommates, housemates, because of lack of affordable housing, because of the lack of living wages, and then also sometimes working, um, living in housing provided by employers that also is at substandard, substandard. The last piece that I'll mention, Audra, is that um, the fear that immigrant workers um, and immigrant communities face as a result of the last four years, which was really an all out war on uh, immigrant communities, the fear of law enforcement as our black and brown brothers and sisters face, the, la the fear of immigration enforcement being detained and separated from your family. And then lastly, the fear around public charge, which was this immigrant wealth test that was created by the last administration. All of that has resulted in people being afraid to seek medical care, even when they're eligible for it or for their family members. And now that fear translates also into the fear of the vaccine as well, and whether or not, and confusion around whether or not they're eligible for it. Well, oh, thank you, Manilina. We're going to unpack that more. Amy, how about some of your preliminary, preliminary thoughts? Thank you again for the opportunity to participate on today's panel. Um, and I do want to again convey Attorney General Raul's regrets that he couldn't attend today. Um, the racially disparate impacts of COVID have been, been apparent to our office from the outset of the pandemic. And we've seen systemic inequities impact the health of black and brown communities in multiple ways, including as Marlena mentioned in the workplace and in the healthcare system. And at work, we, we know that a disproportionate share of frontline essential workers are people of color and immigrants. And we saw some of the worst initial outbreaks in meat packing plants, which tend to be low wage jobs staffed with high numbers of people of color and with immigrants. And from the start of the pandemic, our office uh, through the Workplace Rights Bureau and attorneys from other bureaus, including civil rights, set up a hotline to respond to constituent calls regarding workplace safety. In responding to those calls, our office worked closely with local public health departments to push for added protections for workers in these plants, such as greater separation for workers on the line and more PPE. But we were starting from a baseline where workers were compelled by economic circumstances to work a job that put their health at risk. And over the last year, on that hotline, we fielded over 8,000 calls from people who were worried about inadequate COVID safety measures in their workplace. And a large number of those calls were from immigrant workers in those frontline jobs. We also got calls from family members of workers because the workers themselves were afraid to reach out um, even to the hotline because their employer might retaliate against them. And so we saw during the, the pandemic that this has put a spotlight on the vast disparities in the conditions that people of color and immigrants encounter when they go to work every day. Um, and we've seen the ways that those workplace disparities translate directly to healthcare disparities. And we've also seen through the pandemic other inequities in our healthcare system. The race disparities that we see can't be blamed solely on pre-existing risk factors for black patients or other patients of color. For example, we've seen disparities in staffing and nursing homes that emerge based on the racial composition of the patient populations that are being served. And those staffing disparities impact the quality of care. Research has shown during the pandemic that nursing homes with higher proportions of non-white residents also experienced higher rates of sickness and death. Thank you so much, Amy. So all of you, just in your opening, you've given us a lot to, to talk about. So let's, let's get into some more of this. So I want to start with something that um, actually all three of you have mentioned, but uh, most recently, Amy and Maria Elena, and that's about vaccine hesitancy. So despite the existence of multiple vaccines against COVID-19 now, we've heard a lot about this concept of vaccine hesitancy or the, the fear of taking this vaccine. 
Um, and this fear has been found among many different groups, but we're hearing it especially from certain communities of color. So among African-Americans, we've heard about this, this fear described because of our nation's dark and difficult history of medical experimentation that lasted well into the 1970s. And statistically, the rates of vaccination among African-Americans in Illinois um, has been considerably lower than the percentage of the population. So Janice, I'm gonna start with you. So as it pertains to the African-American community, have you found that lower rates of vaccination, are they attributable to solely, solely or primarily vaccine hesitancy? Or do you think there are some other issues at play, including access? I think it's both. So the vaccine hesitancy is a real issue and um, definitely the trust issues are real. Um, we always hear about Tuskegee, but that's just one example of this experimentation. Um, we also came from, we had an administration that didn't foster and um, promote a lot of trust among communities of color. We had a lot of things, you know, they kind of, you know, the conspiracy theories really started at the top. So that contributed to these trust issues. And definitely that is one of the one, that is a big thing that we have to overcome. We can do that by serving as examples, increasing our healthcare workforce and really being champions on the community level to get people to, to, to get vaccinated. But it's not just trust, it's also an issue of access. Um, initially, the vaccine rollout was really not very equitable. It's improved, it's still not equitable, but we started, we had to use the internet to get access. Um, we used pharmacies to, to give people access. There are many counties in this country that don't even have pharmacies. Um, I'm in Washington, DC, we have very few pharmacies east of the river where black and brown communities tend to live. So the initial rollout really started off. It's actually improved some, but there's still issues um, using the internet when we have um, places even in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago where I'm from, where you can't even access the internet is a real issue. So it's really a combination of trust as well as access. Thank you, Janice. And Marilena, I'm going to follow up with you because you spoke explicitly about fear, fear mongering, fear that was keeping people away from uh, facilities, doctors, other sorts of things within the immigrant community. So tell us a little bit about the vaccine hesitancy and whether it's really about the vaccine or other factors. So as Janice said, it's it's a combination, right? So the fear is one piece of it. I'd also add for immigrant communities, language um, access is also another piece. And then frankly, just confusion about what is available, what are they legally eligible for or not. And so um, when I think about the 25 million limited English proficient people in the United States um, who face a lack of information that is culturally appropriate, that's in the language that they understand. I'll share a story, for example, one of our partners in Virginia, um, the Hispanic Resource Center in Hampton Roads, Virginia, um, had to advocate over and over again with city officials after their Google translated materials from, from English to Spanish. Um, these were the, this was a Spanish translation of COVID materials specifically said that the community did not need a vaccine. Um, so that's one example. And that required a lot of advocacy. Um, second, you know, we have, um, we've done a lot of advocacy and the Shriver Center and other partners um, on this is called probably have been part of that advocacy to get the now Biden administration who has been very clear and unequivocally said that everyone is available, eligible for the vaccine and encouraging people to come forward regardless of immigration status. And the CDC has also made that clear. However, in the administration of it, we have um, CVS and Rite Aid uh, pharmacies, for example, still requiring social security numbers or at least asking for it. And then that without saying explicitly that that's optional and that that's not required, then people think, oh, I should not then get the vaccine. I should not apply, I should not register because that, that will be followed up with information and questions about my immigration status. Um, and then lastly, related to the fear, um, is uh, around again because of immigration enforcement in the last four years and because of the public charge when there are questions um, that that immigrant community members have about whether their information will be shared with immigration enforcement or with law enforcement um, that again that that the privacy protections become really critical and that is one of the things that we think the Biden administration needs to beef up more to make sure that that confidentiality is there and that there's community navigators and community health partners can share that information with trusted messengers. Thank you so much. Very important information. Actually, I'm, I'm learning a lot from you right now. 
Um, I wanted to use what you just said, Marilena, and transition a little bit into some of the, the work of uh, the Attorney General's office. So Amy, let's talk a little bit how, about how the AG's office has been very proactive in defending the Affordable Care Act and the health care and civil rights of immigrants through participation in litigation and administrative advocacy to defend vulnerable communities in Illinois against the previous administration's attacks on immigrants and healthcare coverage, and the continued attempts to dismantle the ACA. Tell us how you see the role of the AG's office in promoting health equity and affordable coverage now that we no longer need to actively defend the ACA from, from attacks. And as kind of a second question to that, when do you think the Supreme Court will rule on the ACA case and, and what happens after that, whether positive or negative? Wow. Uh, well, I, I, I definitely uh, can't predict uh, when when the Supreme Court is going to rule on anything. I think there are a number of, of uh, cases where folks have been waiting for, for quite some time to see um, you know, what, what, they'll, what they'll pick up and, and what direction they'll go in. Um, as you mentioned, uh, our office has been um, for you know, for the, the last four years, really um, heavily involved in multi-state efforts to, um, to to preserve the Affordable Care Act and to push back on efforts by the, the Trump administration to roll back uh, civil rights protections for immigrants and for um, other communities of color. Um, now that we're uh, you know, in, in a different administration, um, you know, we're, uh, that, that doesn't mean that the, that the fight, uh, that the fight doesn't continue. Um, you know, we're, uh, for example, working to um, preserve healthcare access for people in underserved communities and to track issues like uh, uh, proposed closures um, in Chicago and, and in other black communities um, of community hospitals. We're working to look at issues of implicit and explicit bias in the healthcare system and to ensure that people have access regardless of their um, immigration status, their color, their national origin to, to healthcare and to other public accommodations. Right, thank you, Amy. And actually, I'm, I'm glad that you, you mentioned a bit about community hospitals because I have a, another question for all of you. So community hospitals that paid, have played an integral role in providing access to people living in underserved communities. But many community hospitals were already struggling to stay afloat prior to the pandemic. And since the start of the pandemic, hospitals and health systems, both urban and rural, have faced unprecedented financial pressures resulting from the astronomical cost of preparing for a surge of COVID patients, uh, combined with the slowdown of regular operations for non-emergency care, and treating a growing number of uninsured patients. So to all of you, in light of the fact that so many of our essential workers of especially those of color, rely upon community hospitals for care. What is being done, done to ensure that their doors remain open during this most critical time? Uh, Dennis, I'm gonna start with you, both as, a, as a, a native of Chicago and living in DC. I'd like to see some of your thoughts or hear some of your thoughts about community hospitals and, and what we need to do to protect them. Well, one thing, and it doesn't necessarily apply to Chicago or DC, but Medicaid expansion, in states that actually don't have Medicaid expansion, um, you know, they have even faced bigger problems in terms of closures of hospitals. So one thing is just advocating for universal Medicaid expansion. I think there are 12 states now that they haven't expanded Medi Medicaid. So that is actually really, really important. Um, you know, the, the financial burdens from COVID have hit all hospitals regardless of, of whether you're a public hospital, regardless of state and location. So I think advocating for better coverage and those that coverage will help hospitals stay open and it helps the community at large. It doesn't just help one population. And I think educating people that for that and, and being proactive about that is really important. Thank you. Marilena, how about you? Yeah, you know, community hospitals are literally, literally the lifeline for immigrant communities, most of whom are excluded from health coverage. And so, you know, while one in 10 U.S. citizens is uninsured, one in four lawfully present immigrants is uninsured, and half of the undocumented immigrant communities. And that, those are the folks who are so reliant on community health centers. And so one piece of that, in, in addition to um, the expansion of universal Medicaid also is expansion of health coverage. I mean, I have to say that 
Um, it's been deeply disappointing to see the Biden administration as part of their immigration bill that was sent to the Senate and to the House that has now been introduced, the US Citizenship Act, even that bill would um, exclude immigrants who would be on a path to citizenship, would exclude them from having um, access to the subsidies under um, the Affordable Care Act, for example. And so there's a lot of work to be done to have a truly inclusive health system um, that doesn't discriminate based on where you were born or um, how much money you have. Um, and so that that is one piece of it. The other piece is, and I think we're starting to see this under the Biden administration, particularly with the American Rescue Plan, is much more money of available for the community health centers. Um, that is, that's critical for all of our communities to have access to those doors remaining open for our communities. Thank you. Amy? Um, as I mentioned, this has been a, a real priority issue for Attorney General Raul. And so our office has been uh, closely tracking the developments relating to the proposed closure of Mercy Hospital. We've been monitoring this case in both the Illinois Health Facilities and Services Review Board, as well as in bankruptcy court and looking for ways that our office can help ensure continued operations for Mercy and for other community hospitals moving forward. Um, because as folks have mentioned, Mercy is really only the most recent example of a years long trend of hospitals in predominantly black neighborhoods filing for bankruptcy or closure. In the short term, we're looking at ways that we can ensure that we're enforcing state laws that protect hospital patients and employees. That includes insured and uninsured uh, hospital patients, as well as both professional and support hospital employees. Um, but for the future, you know, necessary actions could include things like um, helping to improve the financial conditions of community hospitals. You know, we need to maintain state subsidies. Um, hospitals need to assistance to maximize their federal subsidies and looking for maybe other creative ways to monetize safety net services. Um, it could also include strengthening regulatory authorities around hospital closures, ownership transfers, and maintenance, and also looking for ways to strengthen the state's role overall in this, this planning process for comprehensive statewide health planning so that uh, we're not sort of in this position of you know, reacting constantly to, to one-off uh, hospital closures, but where the state is actually looking at this in a more comprehensive planned out way to ensure that folks are getting access to the health care that they need. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. So I'm going to change up the order a little bit. Um, uh, Marilena, I'm going to come back to you because you actually mentioned something that I was going to actually ask um, the panelists, and that was some more about the American Rescue Plan, um, which obviously this is pivotal for many, many communities as we're talking about recovery um, during this period of time, the pandemic and um, the impact on our economy. Tell me some of your just general thoughts about the American Rescue Plan, uh, whether you think its provision should be made permanent, and do you think that it adequately meets the needs of undocumented immigrants? So the American Rescue Plan represents an unprecedented investment in our communities, particularly the most vulnerable. Um, it really is, um, it's, it's uh, an amazing bill to have at this moment, given what we've been through in this country over the last four years. Um, previous recovery bills were not as equitable and particularly for immigrant communities, the previous COVID relief packages actually excluded many immigrant families and many immigrant taxpayers, what we call the marriage uh, penalty that if an undocumented person was married to a US citizen or had US citizen children, they were not the family as a whole was being excluded from COVID relief and the economic package um, stimulus. Um, so the, the American Rescue Plan does a great, takes a great step forward in addressing those wrongs. And yet, um, over 9 million taxpaying uh, immigrants who, who file their taxes with individual tax ID number are still excluded. So there's still work to be done. Um, what I would say specifically um, about the American Rescue Plans, how it meets the needs of undocumented immigrants is that there's still, um, the, going back to the earlier questions, Audra, about fear, um, that's not going to be addressed by one bill, even as, uh, as important as these investments are. It really does require um, the administration to invest much more in regranting um, to community-based organizations, to promotoras, right, our health uh, community activists and uh, educators who are trusted by our community um, so that we can have 
for example, access to the FEMA program that provides financial assistances um, for funeral expenses for immigrants who have been, who have passed away as a result of the pandemic, who don't even know that that's even a, a possibility for them. So there are so many different possibilities um, of work that still need to be done um, beyond the American Rescue Plan. And some of that can be done through legislation, through other bills, such as immigration reform, and a lot can be done through executive action as well. Thank you so much, Marlena. Um, Dennis, how about you? What are some of your thoughts about the American Rescue Plan, things that you, you'd like to see permanent or anything that you think might be missing? Well, the American Rescue Plan um, definitely allows people to buy insurance. It makes insurance more affordable in the marketplace. So, but that's temporary um, and it's still pretty, you know, it's only up to a certain income and it definitely helps people not become broke trying to buy insurance. Um, I think they should extend that and even maybe make it even more affordable for people so that they can buy, buy insurance later. We know that as um, the panelists have mentioned, insurance and coverage helps our community hospitals stay afloat. So this is really linked directly to access for everyone. Okay. Um, here's just a, a question just generally for you all. Um, and I know we, we've been talking a lot about um, between the American Rescue Plan, what's happening for, for black and brown communities. We're talking about some of the unique challenges within specific communities. This is a, a little bit of a, um, an immigration reform related question, but it's also just a broader question about what is our future kind of moving forward. So what I was going to ask is just about the, the future of immigration reform, looking like at the federal and state level as it relates to healthcare coverage and access. But I'm just going to broaden this a bit to say, how do we take advantage of this moment in time that we have been dealing with this a crisis that, as we see, it transcends race, ethnicity, but it does impact communities differently. Are there other ways that we need to be taking advantage of this moment right now to really make some very significant changes um, in the landscape as it pertains to health equity or health access? I will start with um, Amy, can I bring, bring you back in? Um, so, you know, I think one thing that we can say about, you know, as, as we're in the, the second year of this pandemic is that the, the lessons that we've learned um, and the ways in which some of these systemic inequities um, in healthcare, in the workplace, um, you know, and, and in housing in, in a variety of ways um, have really been, been laid bare by the pandemic, um, those lessons are going to continue to shape our work. And um, you know, we're obviously continuing to, to fight for the civil rights of folks in Illinois. Um, but also I think over the, the last four years, one thing that um, the attorney general's office has really uh, built has been um, these partnerships with other state attorney generals and, and figuring out ways to use those partnerships to advocate nationally, um, to uh, improve um, healthcare access, to protect the civil rights of, of everyone in the country and to really fight nationally to, to ensure that uh, we're, we're continuing to prioritize equity. Thank you, Amy. Marilena, how about you? Yeah, so I think for all of the reasons that we've talked about today, um, in terms of the unprecedented challenges that our communities as a whole are facing, we also have um, a historic opportunity to really um, advocate for some of the most progressive policies that are long, long or overdue. And I would say that one thing that I think is really critical in this moment is as we all advocate for either particular issues or for particular communities, that there is a moment for us to all be coming together to fight for these larger issues of equity, both racial, economic, and gender justice and equity that affect all of us and for our democracy. And that means both, again, from an immigrant perspective, that means is making sure that while we're fighting for immigration reform at the federal level and making sure that the um, Biden administration uses all its political capital to ensure that uh, individuals who are who have are long-term residents of our country, right? The 11 million um, who are here, who are our residents, our neighbors, our family members, that they get on a path to citizenship. We must also ensure that the federal government as a whole 
um, centers immigrants as part of its broader racial and economic and gender equity agenda. And then at the state and local level, we continue to make great progress despite the last four years being really horrific for immigrant communities. The fact is that we made a lot of progress at the state level. So it's especially great to see that Illinois has become the first state um, to provide health care to undocumented seniors, for example. And it's great um, given the Shriver Center and so many other advocates who fought for that. And like that role that Illinois has done, there's a lot that can be done from the ground up, from the state and local level, pass passing and enacting more immigrant inclusive uh, uh, policies that actually improve our well being for all. The one thing that's become clear is that. Um, the pandemic has shown how interdependent we all are. Our collective health and well-being requires all of us being healthy. And so making sure that we seize this moment to be fighting for all of us feels really critical. That's a very, very important point. Thank you. And Janice, I'll round it up with you. How do we take advantage of this moment right now beyond what we've already been doing? I also think that, um, as you mentioned, um, and we're not only all interconnected, but health is also very much interconnected with our social policies. So the Shriver Center is ahead of the game. You have always recognized that. But often many states look at health in a vacuum. And when we try to solve health issues, we don't think about the other things like housing policy and food security and all of the other things that go together. So I think this is a really a good opportunity for state and local governments to also realize the whole concept of health in all policies, that we can improve health care but also, by also addressing policies across the board. Uh, can the panelists speak to the lagging vaccination rates among older adults of color? States across the country prioritize older adults to get the vaccine in January, but the systems to sign up and get a vaccine were not appropriate. And even now, those rates for older adults of color are generally lower than white older adults. How should we understand the impacts of COVID-19 at the intersection of ageism and racism? So a huge issue. A couple of things that made it really hard for older adults. We talked about the internet. Um, you know, only, you know, older adults are less likely to have smartphones. They're more likely to have a disability. Um, my mom is blind. So can you imagine if you don't have the internet and you're, you have a disability, how are you supposed to access this? Um, and then transportation issues, you know. So all of these things, um, again, this was, you know, a really fast uh, moving operation, but these weren't things that were taken into account. So there have been a lot of intersections between ageism and racism. Um, we talked about the internet uh, accessibility in communities of color. This tends to be lower and these were all big barriers years to care. If you didn't happen to have, you know, my mom has a daughter who's a physician, most people don't necessarily have that or someone who's internet savvy, then you really are restricted. And so this is still a big barrier that we need to overcome. Um, and um, just even the nature of how the vaccine is in terms of, you know, the Johns, um, the Moderna and the Pfizer required these very special refrigeration um, environments. So you're not even, even able to go to people as easily in the community. Fortunately, there's some, you know, people are starting to address these issues, but this is still something to be aware of and something that I hope we pay greater attention to. Well, thank you, Janice. Amy or Malianina, any thoughts about um, access, uh, vaccine access for older Americans of color? Yes, uh, pretty much covered it. I think the, the only um, you know, points that I would add to that are um, issues like uh, you know, not having communities of color, folks of color are less likely to have a um, specific healthcare provider that they that they rely on, you know, a primary healthcare provider. And that's one mechanism through which, particularly early on, um, folks were getting access to the vaccine. And we certainly saw that with some of the early numbers um, of Chicago versus the suburbs that there were a lot of folks coming in from outside of Chicago to healthcare providers um, within the city. Um, and, the, you know, and, and I think certainly the, the issues of the digital divide um, were, were at play there. I think we've seen over time that uh, you know, there have been a lot of efforts to try and meet people where they are and to prioritize equity. Um, but it is certainly an issue where we see all of these you know, interrelated inequities really um, you know, coming together. Perfect. 
Yeah, Audra, I, I agree. Everything with Janice and um, Amy have shared makes sense. I think the only additional piece I would say, particularly in irreverent communities, is again the lack of information ex being accessible in a culturally appropriate way, including, and I include myself there, I am not much about Western medicine. Um, and so, you know, looking at how do you speak to someone about um, getting a vaccine when there's so many questions about how how the back a lot of it's the same questions in in the general population like is this vaccine really proven did it get tested and having trusted messengers right ha family members community members equipped with how to even explain that to their family members to their older um, you know to their elder um, family members is really critical so that culturally appropriate it's not just a translation but who gets the information who can share it in a way that people understand and ultimately be able to trust. Perfect, thank you so much. I'm gonna work backwards, analyze. Um, Amy, I'm gonna go back to you for just a second. Um, one question that came in um, for those who are here in the state of Illinois. The question is, is there a central web-based site that highlights all of the successful programs that have been implemented? And what about the remaining challenges that, that uh, uh, need grassroots support? So. I know that the AG's office obviously is a great repository for information and they have access to some sites. So I wanna know if you might be aware of some sites that we can refer people to for those who are living in the state of Illinois. Yeah, so I don't have the web address um, right at my fingertips, but I do know that the, the Illinois Attorney General's website since the early days of the pandemic has had a COVID specific uh, website um, that's been updated with resources that relate to workplace safety. Um, I think uh, issues relating to, to vaccine hesitancy, um, uh, housing related issues, um, you know, civil rights complaints, uh, healthcare and consumer issues. Um, we got a lot of complaints, for example, about things like price gouging during the pandemic. And I would definitely encourage folks to visit our, um, our website's uh, COVID uh, website. Thank you. So now I'd like to ask a question about um, medical legal partnerships. So the, what, would, what do you find could be the role of academic institutions uh, within communities to help advance health equity? Marilena, I'll throw this one to you. Sure. I mean, I think that um, medical institutions, you know, again, even just tying it back to the last comment that I made about information about how the vaccines have even been developed, the fact that there haven't been cut, corners cut, et cetera, um, that explain that, you know, in a, um, I was going to say non-legalese, but actually in, in simple English that then can be translated to other languages. The other piece is academic institutions that are partnering with community-based organizations, right, with, again, everything from faith leaders, educators, right, our teachers, right, being some of the people most trusted in our communities, nurses and promotoras and others who um, our community members go to. And I saw in the chat, one of the messages about radio, for example, is so critical in immigrant communities as one of the most important sources of information. Um, having your local Univision or Telemundo for Spanish language, for example, have um, Q&A sessions. So there, there are lots of different possibilities, but again, making sure that those academic and legal institutions are partnering with community-based organizations. Great, thank you. Janice, how about you? The role of academic I, institutions. I really, I feel, uh, Mary Elena, you said it perfectly. I think the partnerships are important. I mean, even one thing is just starting with their patients and making sure patients get access, but we know that everyone isn't already, always connected with an academic institution, so we can't just stop there. I think the partnerships um, you know, leveraging, you know, they have healthcare providers that can go out there and deliver um, the vaccine. So leveraging all of those strengths, um, th those are all really important. So I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Mary Elena said. I think the partnerships are key. Perfect. And thank you to my team. For those of you looking in the chat, for those who are living in Illinois, um, we dropped in the AG's website for COVID resources. So Folks are working faster than I'm speaking, so thank you. Um, another question that I have, here we go. How has the remote office impacted low-income and isolated individuals? So we've, talked, so we've been talking about this, but now we're kind of focusing more specifically, access, connection, isolation, paperwork. 
um, we've mentioned this as challenges. So maybe we can kind of redirect this question to talk about how we've been able to overcome some of these challenges working remotely because we've been in this now for over a year. Um, I'll work backwards, Janice, I'll start with you. Um, well, I've been seeing some of the chats. Someone mentioned the mental health, and I think the mental health issue is a real issue that we need to talk about. Um, I think um, in terms of working remotely, we don't have that connection with other people. Um, in terms of how can we overcome this, um, I'm not sure of the best answer <laughs> to this, but I do think just having an awareness of this is really important, that this has been a really stressful thing. We have, especially older, when we're talking about older adults, they rely on that connection. And now we have this digital world where we no longer have that connection too. So yeah, it's, been, it's been something really positive, but we also see that a huge group of people, people who can't, don't have that ability to work from home, people who can't Zoom in from the office and older adults do have, have that, that loss of connection. So I think we have to make sure we still connect with them in this new world. Hopefully I answered that answered the question that was in the chat. Did you want to jump in? Sure, this is a really hard one. There's no easy answer. I love, Audrey, you trying to like reframe it of like, what have we done? I mean, one, I think is awareness, right? The, the mental health, um, as Janice was just saying. For immigrant communities, there's a slightly different situation. On the one hand, the majority of immigrants are actually not working remotely, right? They're actually being forced to work and show up to work. Um, and so that results in a couple of things. One is I would say for those of us who do work remotely, who are relying on not just immigrant workers, but everybody else who's going is showing that gratitude, right? Like acknowledging their work, like believe it or not, it's amazing how much of a difference that means when people are seeing when that person, person is delivering some good to your home, just acknowledging them. Um, second, for the isolation, and this is a way to connect it back to the vaccines and to the masks, is, you know, one of the things that we have been, and with some of our community partners talking about, is a, a way to reinforce why it's important to wear a mask and why it's important to get vaccinated is to end that isolation so that families can get together in a safe way um, and reminding people that the physical distancing does not mean social distancing, right? That there are ways for people to stay in touch and to be creative about that. Early on in the pandemic, I remember hearing from in Italy in particular, um, there was a whole PR campaign about texting is um, the equivalent of a hug. And that was so important because in so many of the immigrant communities um, where we are so used to hugging and it's not possible to do that right now in a healthy way, reminding people that there are different ways to express your love and to check up on your loved ones. Um, but at the end of the day, the mental health needs of our communities have just been, um, ex you know, are now just even more exponential. And so we're making sure that our communities locally, state and at the federal level that we're investing in our communities, um, mental health and mental wellness is really critical. Absolutely. So we're, we're, we're short on time, but I, before we conclude, um, I wanted to make sure, first of all, Amy, if you had anything else that you wanted to add to, just to jump in. Um, oh, and the, the last question, I, I mean, I, th I think uh, Jasmine and I really, really covered it, um, you know, and I think the, the only thing I would add is just, you know, we've been, we've been working at, um, in a lot of ways to make sure that we find ways to sort of maintain um, outreach and accessibility. Um, during the pandemic, you know, through phone lines, through, you know, remote outreach, and, and um, as Marilena mentioned, a lot of the issues that we've seen in terms of um, workplace concerns have been from folks who aren't, who don't have that option to work remotely and who are working places like, you know, uh, meatpacking plants, you know, in, in healthcare, um, or, you know, in, in offices where there's not a, a remote option or in retail. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the, the only other thing that I've you know, come to realize over the last year are that there, there has been some power in finding ways to organize and connect remotely that um, I think, you know, we uh, maybe before the pandemic had a lot of assumptions about who would be able to access, you know, remote events or, you know, who would be able to participate or the ways in which we could organize or connect remotely. And, um, you know, I think one thing that I've seen is that there um, a, a lot of folks um, that, you know, there, there are folks in their populations who have found it more, uh, more accessible to be able to make it onto a, a remote um, event, maybe who would have needed childcare or who would have needed 
you know, um, other types of accessibility who, who've been able to, uh, to connect and access, uh, you know, events or, or um, uh, telehealth services or other things remotely. And so I think that is one thing that we've, we've seen is that, you know, there are ways um, remotely to, to expand access and hopefully we'll continue to um, retain some of those um, accessibility improvements um, even after the pandemic. Absolutely, and we've heard the expression, adversity breeds ingenuity, so this is that time. So I wanna thank you all for, for, for answering these great questions, um, sharing your wisdom. Uh, this has been so helpful. Um, and thank you to the audience for these great questions. We are going to continue um, this discussion and some of the questions that were not answered as we will have breakout sessions that we'll, we'll talk about very shortly. But I, before we transition back uh, to Kenya to wrap things up, I want us to hear from another community voice and a member of Shriver's Community Advocacy Board, or excuse me, Community Advisory Board, Donica Owsley. Hi, my name is Donica Owsley, and an important issue in the healthcare for me would be advocacy. As a Black woman, we tend to have an unwanted higher rate of health conditions where we lack provided health care services and treatment. In my community, I would definitely say access and affordability would be an important issue. Thank you. Thank you all for joining today's conversation. As Audra mentioned, uh, we will continue the conversation and we'll share that information with you in a moment. As I mentioned earlier, that we'll have this conversation today, but also we'll talk about solutions, right? So now it is time to act. There are three things that you can do today, and I promise you that two out of the three are free. First and foremost, if we believe that uh, we should have affordable, comprehensive health care, together, I am asking everyone today to give and give $100 now or spread it out over the year and make a monthly gift to the Shriver Center. 100% is our goal. So I'm asking you today to give $100 in support of the Shriver Center's healthcare advocacy, litigation, training, and network efforts. Now, if you're asking yourself, how will my gift make a difference? I'd say that if you support legislation today, it will help prevent permanent losses tomorrow. So if we want our communities to emerge from this crisis with new opportunities and deeper investments, we must support policy advocacy. The link is in the chat and we're, we hope that all of you will make a contribution to the Shriver Center and the Shriver Center's advocacy efforts. In addition, the second action, we are asking everyone to email your members of Congress to urge them to support the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act and Advanced Health Equity. Information is provided on the screen and also after this webinar, we'll share more information. The third action, sign on to support our petition in support of a healthy Illinois for all. Health coverage regardless of immigration status. We talked about today, that today and that's very important and we're asking you to support uh, by signing our petition today. By the way, there was an additional comments that were sent to us uh, from those uh, who uh, sent a private chat to uh, members of the Shriver Center. Uh, please uh, send your information directly to us. Um, there was information about different campaigns where people can get vaccinations, many resources to share with the community. So I am actually going to ask you if you can to send that to the Shriver Center so we can send that out at large to our community. Thank you so much for those private messages. Now, let's continue on this road to recovery together. Our next event is in June. We'll discuss how we're building an economy that works for everyone. A special announcement will be coming to you soon. Continue to follow our work at PartyLaw.org and on social media. And for those continuing today's conversation, we'll see you in a moment in one of our three conversation rooms. Please join us at PartyLaw.org backslash continue.
Once again, the link is in the chat. Please join us for our conversation. So the last time we were together in person, we said the Shriver Center helps change laws to change lives. Change laws to change lives. So as we close today, I ask that you say it or type it in the chat, change laws to change lives. So I'm asking you today, what bills will you support this year? I'll see you in one of our conversation rooms. Take care. Goodbye. Hi, I'm an emergency room physician. Just yesterday, I diagnosed a woman in the ER with advanced metastatic cancer that could have been avoided if she had gotten regular routine screenings. She didn't have access to these because she didn't have access to adequate insurance that she was afraid to apply for due to her immigration status. This needs to change. Healthcare is a human right. Please help. a licensed professional mental health counselor. After last year, what does recovery look like? Recovery looks like working on our mental and emotional health. We know that many communities of color are struggling with their mental health, depression, anxiety, or even suicidal ideation. They're dealing with systemic racism or even accessing proper care. But there's hope, there's healing, and we're ready to help. Thank you.
Greetings. I am Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul. This past year has caused many of us to reflect upon the racial inequities that impact the various determinants of quality of life. With regards to healthcare in particular, the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified the need to address inadequate access to and implicit bias within healthcare. The continued fight to preserve protections of the Affordable Care Act, the disproportionate number of deaths due to the coronavirus in black and brown communities, the vaccine hesitancy driven in part by a history of experimentation on black people, and concerns about racism and implicit bias by healthcare providers are but a few of the challenges we must take on to end racial disparities in healthcare. I'm excited that the Shriver Center on Poverty Law is taking on the fight to end racial inequities in healthcare. As a son of a community physician who for 30 years served patients on the South Side of Chicago with a commitment to healthcare as a human right, I commit the resources of the Illinois Office of the Attorney General to fight alongside the Shriver Center to address systemic inequities that persist in American healthcare. Thank you to the Shriver taking on this fight.